how did you feel kind of going into Sunday about the team's chances? Um, you know, what were you kind of feeling kind of as the selection just started? Did you feel like you had done enough coming out of the Big Ten tournament or were you nervous? Kind of take us into how you were feeling. Yeah, I, I thought um, I thought over the last several weeks, I thought if we won at – if we won the series at Nebraska, if we swept Michigan – or if we, or if we got to the championship or the Big Ten tournament, I thought that would nail it down. I thought if we did any of those things, uh, and we kept coming up kind of one game short of getting to where I felt we're 100 percent confident in that. Uh, but at the same time, we also were, were were doing enough to get ourselves really close to doing that. I, w- I would say after the game Saturday. Uh, where we we lost and got eliminated. I didn't feel great until I kind of stepped back and looked at more of the metrics and numbers. But when you're in the course of the season, there's not a ton of time to to really be looking at those things. You're not trying to make a case. You're trying to figure out when to bunt and when to make pitching changes. So you're not looking at it as, as terribly close. I think you know, what Jared had, had, had done for us, showing me some of the numbers afterwards, how we had played – I think six or seven league champions, you know, between Missouri Valley and the Conference USA and Pac-12 and the Big Ten. We had played so many good teams, our, our quad one wins, our quad one and two games, and all of putting that body of work together where essentially if you took a couple of those those bad RPI losses out when we had some of those injuries and we're kind of struggling, the resume was still really strong. And I think when I looked, when I realized the Big Ten was the fourth RPI conference and we finished third and then went to the semifinals and lost to the defensive champion. I kind of thought it would we had a decent chance uh, just looking at the landscape. And then once I watched some of those bids, I think there's only really two stolen bids where it could have been four or five really easily. And once those things broke our way, uh, kind of by the end of yesterday, I thought we had a, a, a real chance to, to be in. Uh, it just just were kind of how the way the whole thing had, had kind of navigated. So. I felt halfway decent this morning. I don't think you ever felt really good until you see your name pop up. But over the over the course of like that 48 hours, I went from not feeling very good to feeling uh, kind of by this morning, feeling uh, much more confident. Jack, go ahead. All right, Coach, just after the loss on Saturday, what was sort of your message to the team in the locker room just with the uncertainty of everything? And how did you see them kind of – I mean, what were sort of the emotions like – in that moment, just not knowing kind of what the future held. Yeah. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a very peculiar feeling. Uh, one that I haven't really had before, honestly, but when I was at Wright state, you, you were the one the tournament or you didn't uh, in my first year at Indiana, we won the big 10. Uh, and then we had the kind of the two COVID years where everything was upside down. And so you, there wasn't a normal year. And then last year we we were a, we were a, a slam dunk in. So this was the first time in my life where I, I really was on on the bubble and, and didn't necessarily know, especially not knowing some of the some of the numbers, uh, kind of post game. So I, I just honestly I treated it like it was the end of our season. Um, I don't know if that's the right thing or the wrong thing to do, but it, it was what I felt in the moment. I just wanted to thank. You know, some of those seniors, I wanted to thank Ty Bothwell. I wanted to thank Morgan Colopy and, uh, you know, some of the guys that came in, Tyra Bargic and, and those guys, I wanted to thank them for what they had done for the program. Uh, and and then to thank those guys that, that are going to move into professional baseball for their investment and what they had done for the program. And, uh, you know, just kind of I, – I just think in our society, we don't say thank you enough. I don't, I don't think that we appreciate people in the moment, look, look a guy in the face and say – Thank you for what you've done and how much you cared and how much you gave. And so if that was going to be our last time together, I wanted to make sure that uh, that, that people got uh, it got what they had come and got what they had do. We're, we're appreciated and celebrated. And 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 then, I, you know, we talked about I, I don't know what's going to happen. I told them the truth. I didn't know. And I thought it would be close. I, we had some great wins and then we had some bad losses. And, and I told them that. And so if, if those bad losses were going to uh outweigh it then then so be it we kind of made our bed and we had to lie in it so um that was about kind of the conversation went told the guys i loved them because i do and gave them hugs and and if that was going to be it you know make sure that uh nothing was left unsaid zach go ahead 
Hey, Coach, I know you talked about it a little bit on Saturday and you just talked about it there, but this morning, earlier today, when you guys are all in that locker room and you your name is called, what's kind of that emotion? What are you feeling when you look around that locker room and you see a guy like Ty, you see a guy like Brock or Carter, and you realize that you guys have another week, you guys get more games with them. What were you feeling in that moment when you looked around the locker room and, and saw all that? Hmm. I don't know if you can put a you put a finger on an, an emotion. It's such a hard thing to capture. I guess uh, you you feel relief and you feel a sense of joy for those guys. You feel a sense of accomplishment for them. Uh, you, I think the guys I think of, you know, kind of like the the, you know, the typical guy Ty. You think of Ty and everything you've been through. It's kind of I, I I'm I'm getting old enough now that I can remember recruiting a guy and then watching him grow up and then watching him develop and then seeing him kind of fulfill. Uh, his ability and this so that's the first time for me seeing some of these things you get your first recruiting class that 21 class or so now are juniors and some of those guys are going to go play pro ball and to see them get to to have this uh, this postseason run continue to continue their career it is very fulfilling it's very rewarding I'm just you're just very happy for those guys and then you also look at your freshmen and you're excited that they're going to get a chance to go and see that knowing that those guys are also the future of your program and if you want to continue to have that kind of success, it's so important that those guys see what it looks like and they feel it and um, they're in the middle of it. Although the last couple of weeks, you know, we, we went to Purdue and they had terrific, I think they had over 10,000 people or 10,000 fans in for the weekend. And I mean, shooting, I think Nebraska had 10,000 people at the Saturday game. So uh, it, it just, they've been around the postseason environment, but it's always really important to get those guys in and around it. But yeah, a great sense of relief and happiness and fulfillment for those upperclassmen, especially guys like Ty and, and Morgan Calopy. Nahari, go ahead. Coach, last year you only had one long-length starter in Luke Sennard and obviously got hurt early in the regional, which put you behind. How different will it be this year to have, you know, two guys and both Connor Foley and Ty Botswell that you know can give you a full-length six seven inning start to to yeah. get your pitching set up in the regional compared to last year yeah you're right it, it, as long as those guys are you know obviously feeling good and up for it we didn't get great starts in the in the big 10 tournament our bullpen was was terrific uh it, yeah it would really help it would be a, it would be a big it would be a big lift for us uh, you know obviously the teams that you're playing you're playing against great teams in this situation so you have to go back and look at the at the at the video a little bit. Sometimes, sometimes those really good teams, it's 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 actually better to mix and match and and not allow anybody to get to the lineup twice. And sometimes it's better if you if you have a, a whole, you know, or a consistent pattern where you and you've got somebody that can hit that that can that can pitch to that that the weakness precisely to let those guys run. So it, it would be great if we could get a five to seven inning start from one or both of those guys if the matchup's good. Uh, if it's not, and and we have to go more to a, a a bullpen or a staff setup to just keep them from uh, keep an offense from allowing them to to make uh, uh, adjustments to you, and then to have those guys back up again. You know, we've we've found success in in both different avenues. Where it's you know you've seen Ty go you know six, seven, eight innings. You've seen Connor do the same thing, and you've also seen us in the program have success with with really just playing matchups and. Uh, kind of three outs at a time. So we'll, we'll take a look at this week on, on those teams and and then try to make the best decisions that we can and how we want to match those guys up. Uh, Pete, go ahead. Hey, hey Jeff, uh, congratulations first off. And then um, in terms of scouting the opponents, have you already started? Um, do you look at, at all three equally? Do you really focus on Southern Mississippi? How do you approach that? And again, have you already started looking at them? Uh, I, I have not personally, uh, but the, the the other coaches do a wonderful job. You know, Coach Glant primarily does the 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 pitchers. Or I'm sorry, the opposing hitters, and then Zach Weatherford will do all of the opposing pitchers. He'll put all that information together. He and Denton do that together, uh, and they do an amazing job of that. And then and then Coach Simmons does the shifts and in the in the, the the defensive alignments and any kind of um, niche offensive philosophies the opposing team has. And then to be honest with you, they kind of bring those things to me. And I I like to watch. I'll just kind of pull up. They have all the synergy and all the cut ups and pitch by pitch. I just like to turn on a game and then and just watch a ball game. 
uh, probably from when that was how I did it when I was an assistant. And I watched, you just watch the whole game. And, and so I still like to watch and get a feel for teams that way. So typically what I'll do is those guys are doing all the nuance, the spins, the metrics, the really in-depth recruiting, or I'm sorry, evaluation. And then later in the week, I'll watch one or two games, good games from each one of the teams and kind of get a feel myself. We'll put those together in real time. But those guys have already started doing those things. I, I have not yet. We ran practice right afterwards. You know, it's a, kind of a weird feeling where you're not sure if you're going to do extra interview meetings or practice planning. And so you kind of are putting both of them together at the same time. Uh, so we went and practiced and and then um, I, I got to go, you know, I'm going recruiting tonight. So then you're, you're, you're getting your recruiting schedule together and getting ready to run out the door to go um, watch some, some sectional baseball. So, uh, but I haven't done it, but those guys, those guys were on the phone, on the, on the horn, on the phone, they were calling, Hey, I got this. Hey, you get that report. You get this one. And, and they were putting that stuff together. Uh, was there a second, was there a second part of your question? I'm sorry. Um, the second part was a, uh really wasn't one if you had focused seen anything on southern mississippi um but if you have it that's fine uh that i just a little bit of i i followed them yesterday because there was a potential bid steal in that league and uh and and they had just talked about i i think their 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 better arm the friday arm potentially uh was a was a, a grad transfer it was 88 92 with a good change up and a breaking ball um was was kind of i think first team all conference so we had talked about him just a little bit and we had you know made some phone calls, try to get some information about him. But I've I've heard they're they don't swing, so their miss doesn't strike out. They don't walk a ton. Um, probably a lot, a lot like Rutgers, high batting average, singles and doubles, a lot of uh, early contact and early swings. And then talked about the starter, but that was what I had I had I had, had gotten the cross examination uh, of kind of going back and forth with the guys. But yeah, we'll we'll spend the majority of our time on uh, Southern Miss initially. And then we played Northern Kentucky earlier in the year. And so I, I, I do know those guys a little bit. Uh, they're, those The coaching staff there are some of my best friends. Uh, those guys are awesome. Andrew Elliott, their pitching coach, actually played for us at Wright State, was an All-American closer for us. So I've, I've been friends with Dizzy, their head coach, and Steve Deniman for 10, 15 years. Uh, and then obviously Tennessee, we'll, we'll put those things together. But primary focus on Southern Miss and then ancillary stuff with the other guys. And then once we have figure out who we're going to play next, then you'll do more in depth from there. Carl, go ahead. Yes. Uh, congratulations, coach. Thank uh, you. Uh, uh, when you were playing kind of in this last tournament, uh, your hitters in particular with Nebraska, they were kind of pitching you in spe specifically ways to your weaknesses. Yeah. How are you kind of coaching them through that and then preparing the team to face a slew of different arms in a regional environment? Yeah, no, you you hit it there exactly right. I guess my frustration for us offensively at times is we we ebb and flow where at, at times we're able to to really um, commit steadfast to an offensive plan and philosophy and execute it really well, and at times we we don't. And in there's a there's a little bit of that lack of discipline at times that that keep us from being a great offense every day. And, and that I'm not saying anything I haven't said before. I'm not telling you anything that I haven't told them, that I didn't tell them this morning, to be quite candid with you, or right after the selection show. So uh, we, we here, the reality is this, like if you throw, if you throw hard and you throw and you, you're going to throw hard, you're going to throw a fastball uh, in the zone and, and you throw one breaking ball, we're going to hit you pretty good. Uh, if you throw two breaking balls, uh, we don't hit them as well. And if you throw a really good change up consistently, uh, we have and we flow. And so what the, the thing for us that we have to do is we have to make a decision to not just rely on our talent, not just rely, not rely on our ability. We And that's what I told them is like everybody is now of equal ability. Every, everybody has great players. All the pitchers know your weaknesses. They can all pitch. They can all execute game plans to what you don't do well. And it's not a team-wide philosophy because we don't have really team-wide holes. There's not a consistent theme that that everyone does poorly. It's more based on what you do poorly. And so now everyone at this time of the season can pitch like Nebraska pitches, which is to your specific weakness. So if they throw Josh Pine fastballs in, they're, they're not throwing necessarily Carter Matheson the same way. They're throwing him to a different pitch package. And so you, you've got to be able to execute to your plan. Now, the kid that they threw the Sunday starter, we hit the first two fastballs he threw for doubles, and then I'm not sure he threw another fastball for the next seven innings. So, you know, at some point you're going to have to be able to take change-ups and you're going to have to not, not expand the zone. And at times we've done that really well, and at times you struggle with it, and that's been a frustration of ours. 
Um, but that was a topic of discussion. Like always, you're right on the money with those things. And um, we're just we're just going to have to be very, very professional and we're going to have to stick to it or we're going to get we're going to get our butt kicked. All right, we'll go Mike and then Zach and then we'll have the players hop on here. Yeah, you answered the scouting question pretty comprehens- comprehensively, but I was curious. You had four common opponents with Tennessee and Southern Miss. Does that help at all in the scouting uh, of those teams? Yeah, if if they're willing to help, if the if the opposing <laughs> teams want to help, then sometimes they are and sometimes they're not. You know, you have somebody that may be friends with a staff or they may be in the same league or or something like that, and then they don't want to give them up. To, you know, the difference the the difference in in college baseball now as compared to what it was five years or six years ago is everything's on video, everything's on the track, man. So you, you, somebody else's opinion can help. You know, when, when I was an assistant at, at Wright State, the only thing you had was somebody else's opinion. And it may, they may have been right, they may have been wrong, but now I can you can pull up every video, every metric, everything. So I know exactly what somebody does. I know the percentage of every pitches and every count. Uh, it's, it's just there's so much information there. So you don't really have to rely on somebody else. And as nearly as much, now you may get, Pick plays, you know, Nebraska runs that bases loaded pick play at second base uh, where they try to back pick somebody. And, and we knew that coming into it. Now, we almost got picked off, but you knew that coming into it. Now, there may be some little things like that. Um, you know, Purdue, Purdue would do those huge shifts coming in. And so we worked all week on being able to our lefties be able to bunt. It didn't show like it the first time we played them. But then Devin Taylor laid, a, laid the first successful bunt down to lead off the game at Purdue in the, in the, in the conference tournament. And it screwed them up where now they had to go back and leave their shift immediately. And it opened us up and we had a much better offensive game against them that in the, in the tournament. So little things like that, you can get from other people um, and kind of try to be prepared as you go into it. Um, but a lot of it depends on if they're willing to give it up or not. And if they're not, you, you understand sometimes those, those things happen. All right, go ahead, Zach, with the last one for coach. Coach, back to Saturday really quick. You said that this is one of the best teams and probably the best team, most prepared team you've ever coached to win a regional. Yeah. What about this team and what specific characteristics about this team make them that capable? Yeah, so that's a, it's a great point. You know, and, and that's based on, obviously, you know, Bothwell's got to feel better and and Foley's got to, has got to be able to go out and perform better and feel better and those kind of things, right? They've both kind of battled, obviously, Connor with the back and, and Bothwell with the illness and some stuff. So if those guys are right in, in Bothwell's, you know, 91, 94, and Foley's 94, 98, and those guys, are, those guys are good, you've got, as I already said earlier, you've got two premium starters with swing and miss fastballs that can give you six to seven innings, and you've got a bullpen that's done a really good job in the last six weeks with Reisdorf. He was a mid to upper 90s guy, ADPs, a mid to upper 90s guy, Drew Purr, Drew Burr is a mid 90s guy with the cutter and in the splitter. So you've got you've got real stuff on the mound that can produce swinging and misses with the fastball. You've got a defense that when it's locked in and prepared and 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 all meant where they need to be at, can really go get it. We we can go get it in the outfield. We can take care of the ball in the infield. Jake Stadler has been an excellent defensive catcher, has thrown the ball well. Uh, so defensively, we've got a chance to be very good. And then offensively, to, to Carl's point, when we're locked in and we play well, we follow a game plan, we're one of the better offenses in the country. We can hit fastballs. We can all speed pitches. We have a high walk rate. We slug it well. We hit for average. We hit for power. And so it really is just getting everybody on the same page. And a lot of it comes down to how those starters feel. You're at the end of the season. And those guys have been – they've been through the battles. You know, Ty's thrown a lot of pitches, a lot of innings. Um, but if those guys are locked in and our bullpen's good, we, we can compete with anybody. And then offensively, if we're disciplined enough to follow a game plan, we're physical enough to hit balls out of the ballpark. We can bump for a hit. We can run the bases first to third, second to home. So when you put those things together, those things together, you've got star power on the mound. You got star power offensively, and you've got you've got a, a defensive group that can really take care of the ball. Um, it's just a matter of putting all those things together at the same time. So that was kind of the thing where. You know, we like Ari said, we had we had one we had one real starter last year, uh, and not nearly as much firepower out of the bullpen, and we're much better offensively in many ways than we were last year. Uh, and we've we've played against, I know we played against really good teams at the beginning of last year, but we played against really good teams at the beginning of this year. But playing against you know Purdue on the road, that was a big time environment. They had a great fans, they had a great support. Kudos to them. We've played essentially five road games in a row against Nebraska with you know, seven to 10,000 people at every game. It, it, you've been in those environments. You've been in those arenas. 
Now you've got guys that have been you know here for two and three years that have been postseason teams uh, uh, in both of their years. So they, they've just been in it and around it. So those those I would think those were the factors that I was referring to. All right. Thank you, Coach. You're good. And then I'm going to have the players. They're going to join in right here on my computer. Go ahead and put in the chat if you have questions, and we'll open up with Carl. Awesome. Thanks, guys. I appreciate it. Thank you. Come here. Each of can take two of the seats. Can I say that? Uh, congratulations. Uh, uh, Drew, to start with you, um, can you kind of talk a little bit about, um, you know, in the Big Ten tournament, you got to have multiple outings against different teams. Uh, you know, how did you prepare for that? And then how do you take that into a regional environment? Uh, just prepare for them. Glenn did a great job. Like in the morning, we go over teams and it kind of helped. We, we played them both during the regular season. So we had a, a pretty good idea already of what they had. And so it's really just going out there and just kind of executing pitches just trying to work deep into games, give us a good shot to win. And that's just going to carry over to the regional because we've, we've done it before. We've thrown on the Friday and bounced back on the Sunday. We've thrown whatever type of environment we're into, or if it's early in the game, late in the game, we're kind of ready for everything. And so I'm really excited to see how that works in this regional coming up. Jack, go ahead. Hey guys, uh, this is for either or both of you. Um, Coach Mercer said that after the game on Saturday, he sort of treated it like the season was over, but also sort of recognizing that, hey, you know, it, you, you might you might still make it. I guess what was kind of the emotions of that moment like for you guys and just sort of the, the last few days of just kind of waiting and not really knowing what was going to happen? Yeah, I mean, there was just a lot of uncertainty. Um, you know, we kind of we kind of had a feeling about, you know, we were kind of on the bubble there and, you know, we we knew that went over Nebraska would kind of solidify our spot and, you know, we weren't able to get the job done. So after the game, it was um, really just kind of uncertainty about, you know, what the future held, you know, not knowing if that would be the last time you get to take the field with all those guys um, or if, you know, we'd get a shot this weekend. Um, so just kind of being able to be with everyone and kind of soak in the moment. And, you know, I think it really is going to help us going into next weekend. Nick, go ahead. Brock, when we talked to you guys on Saturday after the game, it, you kind of, it kind of seemed like you guys knew it was very uncertain. What does it mean for you guys now, the way you play, knowing that you didn't know you were going to be in this position? Yeah, I mean, just, you know, now knowing that we're in the tournament and, you know, just getting that opportunity. I mean, it's just, you know, really can't ask for much more, you know, just get an opportunity being one of those 64 teams to compete to, you know, win their final game. So, I mean, just being able to capture that moment and, you know, just, again, take it one game at a time and, you know, really just play for play for your brothers next to you. Zach, go ahead. Drew, going into a regional setting, you've got obviously a plan of how you want to go into and pitch as a staff and what the schedule for pitching might look like. But when things get thrown off, just in general, how do you prepare to pitch in a regional, not necessarily knowing when you might go? I mean, that's just kind of how our whole year has been. Uh, we, we, I wouldn't really say we like a solidified set rotation every single weekend that we were going to follow. So we're kind of used to these kind of moving parts. And we're just going to try to go out and win the first game. And then we'll worry about the second game, the second game. And then we'll try just to win that game. And just kind of go one at a time because um, there's no point like saving arms when you don't ever get to a game four or five. So it's just going to be try to win that game that we're at at that single moment and just kind of go from there. Pete, do you have a question? Yeah, yeah, you do, guys. Can, can you kind of uh, um, have you had a chance at all to see any of the opponents, in particular, you know, Southern Mississippi? And if you have any, any thoughts on them? I mean, not yet. You know, it's all it's kind of a you know just found out about four hours ago who we're playing, so haven't quite gotten the chance to really dive too deep into them. Um, but you know, any team that's still alive at this point is going to be a great opponent. Um, you know, they're going to be able to pitch, they're going to be able to hit, uh, going to be able to play defense. So, I mean, just going out there and playing our game, I think, is the biggest thing. Anybody else got a question? Okay. Ari, go ahead. Obviously, Tennessee, it's not close, close, but it's close enough where it's in borderline driving distance and not that hard to get to. 
How excited are you that you don't have to go quite as far for a regional as you could have, depending on where they selected you? Uh, I, I'm super excited. Um, excited to see the fans show out and just be able to have like my entire family there and all our families there just having a good time. Uh, we we did really well and traveled our families to Omaha. But it was still just nothing compared to the Nebraska fans. But I'm excited to just see, you know, how the fan base comes out. It's really to have always like supported us throughout the year. And I'm excited to see that go down to Knoxville. Uh, Carl, go ahead for Brock. Yes. Uh, Brock, can you talk a little bit about um, kind of the way that uh, Nebraska in particular pitched you guys, um, what you guys had to do to kind of adjust to that, and then just, again, how that kind of applies when you're going to a to a tournament, to another tournament environment? Yeah, I mean, at this point in the season, I mean, we've got 50, 60 games under our belt. So, you know, with all the technology and everything, you know, opponents are able to see, you know, every at-bat, every heat map and all – all the different metrics that go into it. So, I mean, I think Nebraska did a good job of really mixing in every count. And, you know, they were, they were pretty heavy with the off speed and change ups and, you know, they were just able to get us kind of off our timing a little bit, off our plan a little bit. So, I mean, just being able to adjust to that and, you know, being able to really just stick to our plan and, you know, treat every pitch as it is and not get too worried about the next pitch before, you know, that pitch is thrown. Anybody else got any other, any other questions? Speak now or forever hold your peace. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Good to get out of here. Oh, appreciate it. Yep. All right. Thank you, guys. Um, you should all have information on um, credentials and everything, and I'm going to keep passing along anything that I get from uh, Tennessee's side, but if uh, you guys have any other questions, um, feel free to shoot my way. Cool. Thanks, Jared. Yep. Thank, Thank you, guys. You.